Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to brotherlance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. Brotherlance.com This is what God looks like. And I put, from a book I am writing, We are not unlike him in appearance. We are like the shadow of his glory. He has a form like ours, but is also a spirit, a spirit that is a consuming fire. Yes, he has head, hands, feet, arms, and legs. But this is where the comparison stops for us. His skin, if you will, looks like swirling marble as jasper and reddish brown like carnelian stone. From the waist up, he appears as gleaming metal with fire enclosed in it all around. From the waist down, his legs and feet are like pillars of fire, and his hands are light that shoot forth like lightning. His face shines brighter than the sun and his eyes look like flames of fire. His hair is shining white like wool or fresh snow in the sunlight. He chooses to clothe himself in brilliant white robe that is like light itself. The snow white train of the robe swirls around on the ground and fills the entire temple. When he speaks as if you're hearing the roaring of a lion and rushing waters and thunder rolling through a storm. Whenever he moves the smoke of his glory goes before him and behind him and around him and no man has ever seen his face and lived. His throne sits atop a blue sapphire stone that is pure and clear as the sky. The base of his throne has wheels that look like they are ablaze. The throne itself is made of sapphire and also looks like it's on fire. An emerald green rainbow arches over his throne, reaching from one side to the other. There are two creatures that stand above him on each side, each having six wings, which are not unlike the wings of a bird. They cover their face with the two wings, they cover their body with the another two wings, and finally they cover their feet uh, with the last two. They forever say to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The room is filled with smoke and brightness of a rainbow shining every color through the smoke. Finally, I believe the most revealing is that he has all the hosts of heaven beside him on the left side and on his right side. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his cows upon you and give you shalom. Amen. Dear Father, we praise you, we exalt you, we lift you up. Thank you for this wonderful, awesome, amazing Bible study we're doing today of what you look like as, as described in Scripture. And so we praise you for that. Give us the Holy Spirit, God, us your truth, and thank you for revealing this stuff so we can know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Getting to know God, part four, his appearance. Now, we're going to get into it deeper, and there's some details that we're going to cover that aren't listed there. And then we're going to do another recap of just the scriptures without my, you know, turning it into a paragraph. But that's pretty awesome, I think. That's pretty neat, you know. And so we can know definitively the basic appearance of our Father God. So let's look at top of page two. Key concepts. God wants to be known, seen, and understood. Deuteronomy 33, 2-3. He, Moses said, the Lord came from Sinai and revealed himself to Israel from Seir. He appeared in splendor from Mount Paran and came forth with 10,000 holy ones. With his right hand, he gave a fiery law to them. Surely he loves the people. All you holy ones are in your power and they sit at your feet, each receiving your words, right? So God wants to be seen. He appeared to them. He appears to his children. And we're going to get a little more into that. It says, man was created in the image of God to bring him glory. So these are key concepts. First one, God wants to be seen. Second one, we are made in his image. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In God's image, he created him male and female and he created him. And it says, <clears throat> women are created in the image of man to bring glory, him glory. First Corinthians 11, 7, 9, man a man should not cover his head because he exists as God's image and glory. But the woman is man's glory. For man did not come from the woman, but woman from the man. And the man was not created from the for woman, but woman for man. So I put, so while in the same basic image, we could see alterations from the type of the archetype. Just like from, uh, from woman to man. Men have broader shoulders, women have wider hips, and their sex organs are different, etc. Same basic layout with different design features. So humanity, while made like the type, the type, which is God, as the archetype, we express key differences, yet not so different to be unable to understand the blueprint by which we were designed from. We can look at ourselves and understand the image of our Father. So let's look at the form of God. 
God has legs, feet, arms, hands, back, and a face, just like humanity he created in his image. So let's go through these. There's, there's not going to be a lot of commentary on these because, you know, this says what it says. Legs standing, Exodus 34, 5 through 7. Yahweh descended in the cloud, and he stood with him there and proclaimed Yahweh's name. Legs walking, Genesis 3, 8 through 9. When they heard the voice of Yahweh, God, as he was walking in the garden during the breeze of the day, the man and his wife concealed themselves from the presence of the Lord God and among the trees of the garden. So the Lord called out to man, asked him, where are you? Okay, so now we have legs, right? So he stands, he walks, you know, and this is key because God, why spirit, it still does these things. Okay, and so feet, top of page three, Exodus 24, 10 through 11. They saw the God of Israel and under his feet was like a paved work of sapphire stone, like the sky, uh, skies for clearness. He didn't lay his hand on the nobles of the children of Israel. They saw God and ate and drank. Right. So God has feet. Right. So we know this. Next one, arms, Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord Yahweh, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. There's nothing too hard for you. So God has arms. Next one, hands. Exodus 33, 21 through 23. The Lord said, here is a place by me. You will station yourself on the rock. And when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the cleft in the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. So God has hands. Okay, next one. And a back and a face. Exodus 33, 23. Then I will take away my hand and you'll see my back. And But my face must not be seen. So God has a back side, a front side, a left side, right? And so he has hands, legs, arms, everything. So when you look at yourself, we're made in his image. So if you got it, you have some summation of what he has. God has a right and left side, Acts 7, 55 through 56. But Stephen, full of glory in the Holy Spirit, looked intently towards heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Right? So what's cool about this is God in his own decision making, in his own will, decide this is what I look like. This is how I am. Right? So he has hands, he has arms, he has legs, he has a back, he has face. He has all the, the parts we have design-wise, like the appearance-wise, right? And so this should help us understand because, you know, God is spirit, but he's not like a, 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 a mist, you know, or a cloud or, you know, he has his Shekinah glory, his presence, right? Now he's everywhere, but he has a, a, an image of himself that he portrays so people understand him. Right? Okay. So one key difference is that God is purely spirit. John 4, 23 through 24. But a time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such people to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And the people who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Okay? So what type of spirit? Hebrews 12, 29. For our God is indeed a devouring fire. God is a devouring spirit of fire with a, a similar form that man was given by him right so his spirit is a devouring fire that's the description we we're given and so we have a spirit soul and flesh and blood first thessalonians 5 23 now may the god of peace uh, God of peace himself make you completely holy and may your spirit and your soul and your body be kept entirely blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And right, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing, uh, the point of dividing soul from spirit and joint from marrow and is able to judge the desires and the thoughts of the hearts. Right, so why God is purely spirit, we have flesh and bone, right? And so there's a difference. So uh, it's weird because God is purely spirit, but he gave us a physical representation of what his spirit looks like. Kind of cool, you know, and we live in, in a, a physical world, you know, and so it's pretty awesome. Maybe. Top of page four. He will be made full. Uh, we will be made fully into his image when Jesus returns. First Corinthians 15, 50 through 57. Now, this is what I'm saying, brothers and sisters. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because you're flesh and blood. You have the appearance of your maker, but you have a spirit, but you have this barrier that cannot receive the, the kingdom of heaven. You can't inherit it. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen. I will tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the blinking of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Now, 
when this perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then that, then the saying that is written will happen. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And so, we can inherit it. So, God made man in his image, but man was physical. Right? And I believe Adam and Eve had a spiritual power that, you know, they lost, that Jesus demonstrates when he's here on the earth because he can walk on water, speak to things, you know, had a controlling power. Now, Jesus is the second Adam, right? So if you want to know what the first Adam could do, look at the second Adam, right? He could go around and walk on water and heal and do these things, any, any kind of reparative work because what was Adam and Eve's job? To tend the garden, right? Now, nobody was getting hurt or harmed in the garden, but there's things to be done, right? And so when we look at Jesus, we see the power that was given to Adam, right? And so we are going to be made into the image of Jesus, all right? We will be like him. And so we'll re be restored back into that original form that God gave us in the Garden of Eden, but it would be even more, it would be perfect because it's going to be immortal. They had to eat of the tree of life to receive immortality. And as long as they kept eating of the tree of life, they lived forever. And that's why that was, they were kicked out of the garden to remove that from them. Now, we, you would, you know, we're just going to have the immortality. Now, we'll have a tree of life. We'll have all of these wonderful things to eat. But it'll be inherent in us because that is the gift, right? So we can put on the immortality like God. Because right now the Bible says only God has immortality. But we will put it on. And that way we can be with God forever. Pretty awesome. So anyways, next one. We will reflect the image of our Father God and His Son forever. Jesus, Son, Jesus forever. First John 3, 1 through 2. So what sort of love the Father has given to us that we should be called God's children? And indeed we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Dear friends, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when it, whenever it is revealed, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. Right? So we are going to be fully transformed. Right? So when Jesus came back, He could walk through walls appear disappear right so that's going to be the form that we'll have did jesus still have all the same features as a human being yes because those features are from god right and so that's pretty awesome yet despite our similarities to god's form he is very unique and special he can only be seen when he chooses to be seen in whatever form he chooses first timothy 117 now to the eternal king immortal invisible the only god be honor and glory forever and ever amen Right. So he is invisible if he wants to be and he can be visible if he chooses to be. Right. And so we kind of see that also with Jesus walking through the um, uh, walls and or just appearing up in the uh, upper room to the disciples after his resurrection. Deuteronomy 4. 14 through 19, Yahweh commanded us at that time to teach your statutes and ordinance that you might do them in the land where you, you go over to possess it. Be very careful for you saw no kind of form. So when he appeared on the top of the mountain, he said, you saw no kind of form on that day that Yahweh spoke to you and Herod about in the middle of the fire, lest you corrupt yourself and make yourself a carved image in any form of any figure, the likeness of a male or a female, the likeness of an animal that is on earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the sky, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in, in the water under the earth, lest you lift up your eyes to the sky when you see the sun and the moon and stars, even all the army of the sky, you are drawn away and worship them and serve them which Yahweh your God has allotted to all the people under the sky right and so he's saying listen when I came down you saw the fire in the cloud but you didn't see me now Moses obviously did and the, uh, at least his form the backside and then the uh, 70 uh, 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 priests of Israel got to go and have a meal and saw some form of him they specifically mentioned his feet so people are like oh look they, these people saw God well no they mentioned his feet so God could have just shown him his, his feet, you know, and so uh, and say, I have seen God. Like if someone walked around a court and you saw their backside, you say, oh, I saw so-and-so. I didn't really see all of them. Right. And so people get hung up on that. But either way. So God is saying, so we're, this is a warning. So God does not want to be made into an idol, nor for us to worship an image of our own limited understanding. Exodus 24 through 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is on heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water below. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, spent responding to the transgressions of the fathers by dealing with children to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me and showing covenant faithfulness to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments, right? So God doesn't want to be made into an image. So top of page five says, do not use this information to do as such. 
nor create a failed image of God in your hearts and minds. This is purely description given to us for, from first-hand accounts. We won't fully know until we get to see him with our own eyes. God, God allows us to have a basic understanding of his parents uh, to bless us, right? So the danger of making God exactly like man, Romans 1, 21-23, because having known God, they did not glorify him, God, nor gave thanks, but were made vain in their reasoning and their and their unintelligent heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they were made fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of an image of a corruptible man and the fowls and the quadrupeds and the reptiles. So as, as we can see, we are made in his image. Yet as the woman being made in the image of man, there bears remarkable differences. In this example, we can truly understand that while being made in God's image, man bears remarkable differences to his creator. While retaining many of the same features, man does not bear all the same form or function his God has. So God remains exceptionally different and unique. Man is only a shadow of the image of the one true God. There, however, remains enough similarities to glean the basic appearance of God. So when we go over these, we're going to imagine, we're going to put in our hearts and we're going to make an image, right? That's what we do because there's a description, right? We're not to worship that image. We're not to think about it when we pray. We're not to make a pictures of it. We're not to do anything with it, okay? Because it would be really easy to turn it into an idol. And your imagination will fail you in the grandeur of it all. I promise you that, right? And so, and if God decides, well, today I want to change something about my appearance, then you're off, then you're off, right? So what is it, why are we doing this? Because it encourages us to let us know what God is, who he looks like, but not his exact description, okay? And so that's a warning I want to put in here because it's really easy because I, like I know Christians are like, oh yeah, every time I pray, I imagine God on a throne right in front of me. I'm like, so you make an idol? In your heart and your mind, God doesn't want you to do that. You know, we're not supposed to imagine that. We're supposed to just commune with His Spirit, but not make images and, and stuff in our hearts and our minds, right? Because again, we're creating an idol. There's be no difference than making one and setting it in front of you and making one in your heart, in your mind. And you know, and so why these descriptions are awesome and they're wonderful and they're in scripture to encourage us. We have to rightly balance it in our hearts and minds, right? And and realize it's just there to encourage us. It's like there's some descriptions that people try to give of Jesus. I guarantee you they're all wrong. They, they missed the mark. You know, and so, but we don't have to have an image of Jesus to worship uh, God and his son and serve them. Okay. So anyways, let's continue. The appearance of God. The great verse that I, the greatest verse I could think of that describes God's appearance is following. James 1.17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from, a, from above coming down from the father of lights with whom can be no variation nor shadow or turning shadow, right? So that perfectly describes it because one thing where you're going to notice going through all these uh, descriptions uh, of God's appearance is how much light action is going on. It's like, you know, like almost like a rave. I mean, there's lights and there's smoke and there's, I mean, all these really cool things. Uh, okay. The overall appearance of God, Exodus 24, 17 through 18. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain, the eyes of the children of Israel, right? So he's lights, he's a fire, he's burning, okay? So I've said, feel free to look these verses up in their entirety. Yet for the sake of the study, I divided each verse into sections pertaining to the point of description being presented. I felt this would help us better grasp each point clearly without confusion. So it's Exodus 24, 17 through 18. Daniel 7, 9 through 10, Daniel 10, 5 through 6, Revelation 4, 1 through 11, 1 Kings 22, 19, 2 Kings 19, 15, Ezekiel 1, 4 through 28, Ezekiel 3, 12 through 13, Ezekiel 10, 1 through 22, Deuteronomy 33, 26 through 27, Isaiah 6, 1 through 4, and Habakkuk 3, 3 through 19, okay? That's where our, our, we're getting all this from. So, the scene setter, so I thought it'd be good, let's set the scene, right? Before we get into what God looks at, let's look at where he's at. Uh, the location of his throne in heaven, Revelation 4, 2. Immediately I was in the spirit and the throne was standing in heaven with someone seated on it, right? Top of page six. So we ask ourselves, well, he's in heaven. The throne's in heaven. Does that throne travel? So I put on top of page six, does it travel? Ezekiel 1, he called it a vision when God appears to him. Daniel 10, he called it a vision when God appears, appears to him. And then Exodus 19 uh, God's presence for sure came down upon the mount. I think it's safe to presume that he came with his throne carried by the cherubim. So let's look at that. I would say yes, the throne travels. Deuteronomy 33, 26 through 27. There is no one like God, O Jeshurun, I guess. 
who rides through the sky to help you on the clouds and majesty. The everlasting God is a refuge, and underneath you are his eternal arms, and he has get, uh, driven out enemies before you and has said, destroy, right? So he, uh, the one who rides through the sky to help you on the clouds and majesty. And of course, we know those clouds aren't just clouds. Those are angels, you know, the glowing ones. And so I would say, yes, it travels. There's another verse later that describes that more fully. God comes and goes from his throne, Daniel 7, 9, 8. While I was watching, thrones were set up, and the ancient days took the seat. Because you wonder, I was like, was God just always sitting on his throne? Obviously not, because he walked in the garden. Right? So we know his throne travels. We know he gets up and sits down. He knows he goes, he does stuff. Right? Now, it's, it's he's got to do whatever he wants. But like, he's like, well, you're already everywhere. But I, this one thing I've learned about God. He might understand everything, know everything. He likes the experience of it. So it's like me. I know my kids love me. I love the experience of hearing I love you in the hug. I know exactly. I know what a hug feels like. I know what a, a I love you sounds like. But I enjoy the experience of it. Right. And so that's why I believe you see God walking, moving around, walking in the garden. Right. He wants the experience of it. He wants the experience of a family, of the body, loving him, him loving them. Right. Being with them. OK, so. God sits upon his throne. First, uh, first Kings 22, 19. Micaiah said, that being uh, the case, listen to the Lord's message. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the heavenly assembly standing beside him and on his right and on his left. Right. And next one, his throne sits upon the cherubim or seraphim. Second Kings 19, 15. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, Lord God of Israel, who is enthroned on the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kings of the earth. You made the sky and the earth. So that begs the question, what do cherubim slash a seraphim look like? I said cherubim are the are the proper name, it's like cherub, and seraphim is the descriptive name meaning burning or a flame, right? And there's debate, and I went over this, and it took quite a bit of time just weeding this out in scripture, if there were two different things. Isaiah is the one that says seraphim, but it's description, and it's, it's just a word. It means fiery, and it said the fiery ones. You know, there was, he had no words to describe what they were. Okay, so I wholeheartedly believe cherubim, seraphim, same thing. One's a proper name, you know, and the other one's a descriptive name, okay? So the four faces, right? And so the, the Bible says that God is enthroned upon the cherubim. So that begs the question, what do they look like? Ezekiel 119, as for the likeness of their faces, they had the face of a man. The four of them had the face of a lion on the right side. The four of them had the face of an ox and on the left side. And the four of them had also the face of an eagle. Comparing the two lists, we see the ox is the face of the cherubim. Exodus 10, 14, every one of them had four faces. The face was, The first face was the face of the cherub. I highlighted it in red so you can see and go back and forth. The second face was the face of a man. The third face was the face of a lion. And the fourth face was the face of an eagle. So the Bible tells us the face of a cherub is natural face is the face of an ox. And then they have the other four other three faces, right? And so, and what's interesting because... Uh, here in Ezekiel, he didn't know really what to describe when they first saw, right? But by, later on, he, he, he goes on, right? So right here, it says, this confirms that the two lists speak of the same living creature. Ezekiel 10, 20 through 22. This is a living creature that I saw un under the God of Israel by the river Ch Kabar and knew that they were cherubim. Everyone had four faces, everyone four wings. The likeness of the ha hands of the man was under their wings. And as for the likeness of their faces, their faces which I saw by the river uh, Kabar and their appearance in, uh, in themselves, they went straight at forward, right? And so cherubim naturally look like the ox. Okay. And so they have ox, eagle, lion, and man's faces, right? And so that's pretty interesting. So here we go. We're going to look in like the appearance of the cherubim and seraphim, right? And why I believe, just not a big point, but why I believe they are exactly the same thing is you just get two dis descriptions here. Ezekiel 1, 5 through 12. In the fire, and this is good description too. Uh, top of page 7. The appearance of the cherubim, cherubim, Ezekiel 1, 5 through 12. In the fire were what looked like four living beings. In their appearance, they had human form, right? 
So there you see, God is fond of this form. He's given it to the uh, angels. He's given it to man. Now ours is different than theirs. But each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight, but the soles of their feet were like uh, cash feet. They gleamed like polished bronze. They had human hands under their wings and on their four sides. And then for as for their face and wings of the four of them, their wings touched each other, did not turn as they moved, but went straight ahead. Their faces had the appearance. Each of four had the face of a man with the face of a lion on the right, the face of an ox on the left in the face of an eagle their wings were spread out above them right i believe that's a set of wings each had two wings touching the wings of the other's beings uh, on their either side and two wings covering their bodies right each uh moved straight ahead wherever the spirit would go they would go without turning as they went as for the likeness of the living creatures their appearance like burning coal of fire the appearance of the torches the fire went up and down among the living creatures the fire was bright and lightning and went out of the fire ezekiel 123 under the expanse the, the throne, right, because they're holding the throne. Their wings were straight out, one towards each other. Each one had two wings covered on, on the sides, each had two which were covered the bodies on that side, right? And so Ezekiel 10, 22, and all their flesh and their backs and their hands and their wings and their wheels are full of eyes round about to them for four and their wheels. Now there's debate in the church. Are cherubim, seraphim, seraphim, cherubim? I think they are. I could be wrong, but here's the thing. They're awesome. <laughs> we, can, we can end with that. But, uh, and so when we get this description of these beings, right? And so they're holding up the throne. Later, we'll get on the description of the beings above his throne. And so right now, we kind of get this idea, this pavement, this clear as glass crystal uh, frame with the sapphire throne, throwing these awesome looking angels with eyes all over their body and these we uh, wheels which we'll talk about and this flame that's in them and bouncing in between all of them and their cool faces i mean that's pretty neat i think that's pretty awesome description of the throne Ezekiel 1, 22 through 23. Over the heads of the living beings was something like a platform glittering awesomely like, like ice stretched out over their heads. Under the platform, their wings were stretched out, each towards each other. Each of their wings also had two wings covering their body. And then Ezekiel 1, 26a. Above the platform of, over their heads was something like sapphire shaped uh, like a throne, right? So it's a, now it's not a throne shaped like a sapphire. It's a sapphire shaped like a throne, right? So that should tell you, it's a, just this beautiful jewel that obviously has a seat in the back or whatever God wants. But that's pretty awesome, right? And so you got the clear base, the blue sapphire, Ezekiel 10.1. As I watched, I saw the platform above the top of the cherubim, something like sapphire, and resembling the shape of a throne appearing above them. Daniel 7.9d. His throne was a uh, was ablaze with fire, and its wheels were all aflame, right? Revelation 4.3b. A rainbow looking like it was made of emeralds encircled the throne, right? So we're getting this picture, clear base, blue sapphire throne, fire wheels that are on fire, rainbow going around the backside, and it's emerald green. Revelation 4, 5a, from the throne command, flashes of lightning, roaring, and crashes of thunder, right? And so this is a noisy thing, right? There's like oh, this rumble that's going on. Revelation 4, 6b uh, uh, through 7, in the middle of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before uh, and behind. The first creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had, had a face like a lion, and the fourth was like a flying eagle, right? And so here we go top of page eight so we're getting a pretty good description of what this throne room looks like ezekiel 1 13 through 21 when in the middle of the living beings was something like a burning coal of fire like, like torches it moved back and forth among the living beings it was bright and lightning was flashing out of the fire the living beings moved back Word and forward as quickly as flashes of lightning. Then I looked and I saw one wheel on the ground beside each of the four beings. The appearance of the wheels and their construction was like gleaming jasper. And all four wheels looked alike. Their structure was like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they would go in any of the four directions they, the, they faced without turning as they moved. Their rims were high and awesome and the rims of all four wheels were full of eyes all around. When the living beings moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living being rose up from the ground, the wheels also rose up too. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go. And where the wheels, uh, wheels would rise up beside them because the spirit of the living being was in the wheels. And when the living being moved, the wheels moved. And when they stopped the moving, the wheels stopped. When they rose up from the ground, the wheels rose up from the ground. And the wheels rose up beside because the spirit of the living being was in the wheels. Also describes in Revelation 4, 7 through 8. Okay. 
So the sound, right? So we already know that the throne has a this lightning thundering, this cool sound, right? So we earlier, does the throne move? That's what we asked earlier, right? So here's what it sounds like when it moves. The sounds of movement. Ezekiel 124. When they moved, I heard the sound of their wings. It was like the sound of rushing waters or the voice of the sovereign one or the tumult of an army. When they stood in, still, they, they lowered their wings. In Ezekiel 3, 12 through 13, then a wind lifted me up and I heard the great grumbling sound behind me as the glory of the, glory of the Lord rose from the place and the sound of the living beings brushing against each other and the sound of the wheels alongside them. A great rumbling sound, right? So you think... You, like this big bassy like you know lightning crashing thunder boom sound and part of that sound it says from the angels wings rubbing against each other right and so we've heard that noise in birds when they flutter and they flap their wings real quick right so you get a basic idea of this awesome throne white base sapphire has green rainbow around it wheels beside it that are flame of fire eyes everywhere awesome angels and people debate four wings six wings i don't care awesome you know and so and uh, uh so what we have here is this really cool throne i mean as thrones go and always always get caught up i'm like god why did you choose this you know what did, why this design feature not that it matters it's just what he liked you know but i think when we get to heaven he'll explain it more because i'm pretty sure it all has very grand significant meaning and and then one day we'll get to understand because god never does anything willy-nilly like, I'll just make it green. Who cares? No, he's just like, we'll make it green for this reason. You know, and so one day we'll get to know that reason. Okay. The setting around his throne, Isaiah 6, 4. And the house was filled with smoke. So you got that cool throne. And now the whole house is filled with smoke. Okay. Ezekiel 10, 4. Yahweh's glory mounted up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud. And the court was full of the brightness of Yahweh's glory. So we got smoky, bright cloud. Right. Daniel uh, 7, 10 B. Many thousands were ministering and many 10,000 stood ready to serve him. So tens of thousands of thousands, they're ready to serve God. Right. So it's smoky. It's bright. There's light. It's noisy. It's not quiet. There's people ready to serve God. I mean, it's a pretty awesome scene. Revelation 4, 4. In a circle around their throne were 24 uh, other thrones seated on those thrones were 24 elders. They were dressed in white clothing and had golden crowns in a seat. So now we get with you got God's throne. You got a circle of 24 thrones. You got the cool living creatures with all the wings. You got all these people around him ready to serve. Right. This painting a good picture. Top of page nine. Isaiah 6, 2, and above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. Now, real quick, this is awesome because above him, Yahweh God is sitting on his throne. Above him, we have the appearance of the seraphim or burning ones, right? Now, the, the hiccup here for the difference between the, uh, the uh, cherubim and the seraphim uh, is this. They're like, well, they only had one face. I'm like, well, their face was covered. So how do you know how many sides to his face? Because the other description is basically the same. And so but either way, take it as you will. Worth a study. Wrong or right, we know that the cherubim, seraphim, whatever you want to call them, they were there, right? And so our, our, our axe to grind here is not which one is which. I just think they're the same. I could be wrong. I say it's worth a study. But either way, they're there. Awesome, right? They're they're a flame of fire. They're awesome. Got their face covered, their body covered, their legs covered. And so how, how many do we have? We have the four on the ground and the two in the air, right? So there's six. Okay. The sound of the throne room, Isaiah 6, 2, 4. Two, two, four. Above him, right, stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings with the two that covered his face, with the cover, covers his feet, with the two he flew. One called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Right? And so, that's awesome. What does Revelation 4, 8 through 11 says? The four living creatures, each of them having six wings, full of eyes all around within. They have no rest in day and night. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Okay. So we got the two. To me, this is like a choral. It's like a callback. The two up here say, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of armies. The whole, is, whole earth is full of his glory. And the four down go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and who is to come. And the other one top. The holy, holy, holy is the Yahweh of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was in his. That's what I'm thinking is going on. I could be wrong. But that's what I'm getting from it. Okay. 
It said, when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sat on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and throw their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, the Holy One, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And because of your desire, they existed, right? So that's a pretty cool, awesome scene, right? It's loud. It's noisy. There's people there. There's lights going off. There's smoke. It's not this, like, quiet church mouse scene where, like, everybody's like, don't make a move, <laughs> you know? So there's angels saying or singing They're what they do. There's people prostrating and worshiping God. You know, these are all very good things. So his presence... Hebrews 12, 29. For our God indeed is a devouring fire. We covered that earlier, right? Daniel 7, 10 D. A river of fire was streaming forth and proceeding from his presence. So God is the consuming fire. And from him, just think of molten, like, like molten lava coming off of a volcano type of thing. You know, where this stream of fire is coming out. Okay. Exodus 24, 7. 18 through 18 and the sight of the glory of the lord was like the devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of god so this is a raging fire god is bright that's that's why i said the best description is coming down from the father of lights he's bright he, he there's no doubt when god's in the room i'm just saying there's no hiding it, right okay and uh so next one exodus 19 16 b there were thunders and lightnings and the thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of an exceedingly loud trumpet right thunders lightnings right exodus uh one four an enormous cloud with lightning flashes such that bright light rimmed it and came forth it like glowing amber from the middle of a fire right this is his present so he's bright he's red he's glowing it's smoky there's lights going everywhere i mean this is i mean this is an awesome scene i want to cgi it or something just to get an idea but habakkuk 3 3 through 4a god comes from timon the holy one from the mount paran salah his splendor has covered the skies the earth is full of his glory his brightness will be as lightning right so he's super bright right and so let's see the effect of his presence he purifies and makes holy exodus 3 4 through 5 when Yahweh saw that he came over to uh, that he came over to see, God called him out of the middle of the brush and said, Moses, Moses, he said, Here I am. He said, Don't come close. Take off your sandals, for this place you're standing on is holy ground. Right? So where God is, he purifies, he makes holy. Now there's deeper stuff to this that I think I'm gonna actually do a Bible study on. It might be part of the next one, because this is part one. There's got part two to this. And so um there's a reason for this, a big reason, and it's a pretty awesome reason. But either way, when God is present, he purifies and makes holy. That's why people can't see his face and live, because he will take everything that is impure out of you, and that would be the end of you, right? And that's what he does. And so uh, part of next week uh, or our next study will be like the effect of God's presence on creation, and that will be part of it. So top of page 10, his appearance. Okay. His form, Ezekiel 1, 26b. High above on the throne was a form that appeared to be a man. So it appears to be a man. We covered that earlier. Revelation 4, 2. Immediately I was in the spirit and the throne was standing in heaven with someone sitting on it. Right? So God has the appearance or we have his appearance. But when we, if you were to look at him, you'd go, well, you look like a human being uh, from a distance, at least the outline. Okay. His attire, Daniel 7, 9b. His entire his attire was white like snow. Mm -hmm. Daniel ten five. I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen. Around his waist was a belt made of gold from Ephaz. Right. So linen with a gold girdle around the waist. Right. Isaiah six one b. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Mm -hmm. Right. So that white linen robe fills and circles around and fills the ground up with the temple. Right. And on um, near that is a flow of what looks like fire coming from him while he's wearing a golden belt. It's pretty awesome. With You know, it's awesome to say, behold, our God, he has hair and it is white. Daniel 7, 9, C, the hair of his head was like lamb's wool. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's white. 
His coloring, Revelation 4.3, and the one seated on it was like Jasper or Cornelian in his appearance. Uh, appearance. Jasper is red and Cornelian is light orange. Cornelian looks like glowing metal. It's a beautiful stone. I never knew it until I looked it up. I was like, man, that is a beautiful stone because it just looks like it glows. It's amazing. Ezekiel 1, 26b through 27a. On the likeness of a throne was the likeness of appearance of a man on it. And I saw it was glowing metal as the appearance of fire within it all around. From the appearance of his waist upward and from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw it was, it was the appearance of fire. Mm-hmm. Right? And so we can gather from both descriptions, Jasper must have been red Jasper, just like Jasper with its mineral veins. When metal becomes very hot, the heat swirls around, creating a 3D effect. Cornelian looks like red hot metal with a light orange that seems to glow. Right? And so uh, I think we've all looked into a, a fire, campfire, and it gets so hot in there and it starts doing this number because of the heat, you know, and that's what you get. Right? And so some people in script in here... Uh, they argue about what color Jasper that is because a lot of these precious stones come in a lot of different uh, versions. But since we have both descriptions, we can know it's red Jasper, you know, or it's red. Okay, Daniel 10, 6a. His body resembled yellow Jasper. Some translations say uh, barrel. Uh, yellow Jasper looks like mu- uh, muted mustard color, almost like the yellow of a flame when heated very high. There's also a yellow uh, barrel that is clear stone. I think for the three descriptions, we get a unified idea of the color of fire, flaming hot and swirling, containing the colors yellow, orange, and reds. Right? And so that's pretty awesome. And hence, he's a consuming fire. It's goes hand in hand so what's interesting is what's interesting is that when god created man adam the word used there means ruddy or reddish from another word meaning to show blood blushy or rosy god made man in his image and used the same color spectrum he could have made us pink with purple polka dots he could have made us you know black i mean like skin not like what we call black today but actual pitch black you know but he made us in a tone and i'm sure that adam was more of like you know from like middle east indian indian descent look where there's a redness to him right in his color and then we get all the variations you know of humanity so no i do not think adam was a white guy (laughs) just putting it out there (laughs) not not happening but anyways he's more middle eastern but uh looking so anyways uh, Strong's Concordance, H120 Adam from H119 uh, Ready, that is a human being, an individual, or the species. So that's from Strong's Concordance if you want to look it up. Okay, top of page 11 as we close out. Arms and feet, Daniel 10, 6D. His arms and feet had the gleam of polished bronze. Right? So his arms and feet had the gleam of polished bronze. Now remember, we heard his legs look like fire and his feet look like polished bronze. So did his hands. Hands. Habakkuk 3, 4B, a two-pronged lightning bolt flashing from his hands. That is the outward display of his power. So in God's hands, is like lightning. Polished bronze, but lightning. Right? Pretty awesome. And his eyes, Daniel 10, 6C, his eyes were like blazing torches. Okay? I want to come back to that one in a second. His face... Daniel 10, 6b, and his face had the appearance like lightning, right? So we got polished bronze. We got eyes that are flames of fire. His skin was like bright as lightning, right? And then you got the uh, the carnelian jasper upper body look and the flames of fire, thighs and legs, mm-hmm. wrapped in a white garment that is... Um, you know, like uh, what we would call like just cotton or whatever. And then a gold belt. And, the, and with a long train that fills the room, you know. So we get a pretty good idea what our God's like. His white hair, you know. I mean, it's pretty awesome. <clears throat> now, again, we don't want to make idols in our heart and mind. But we can get a basic description. Okay, next one. His glory, Ezekiel 1, 27b through 28b. And there was brightness around him, and it's the appearance of the rainbow that is the cloud in the day of rain. So in the appearance of the brightness all around him, this was the appearance of the likeness of Yahweh's glory. So Yahweh's glory is a swirling kaleidoscope of rainbowish colors. Right. It's just awesome. (laughs) It's just awesome. You know, what can you say? Blessed be your name, Father. You're awesome. You know? And so, and then you throw that in with the description of the throne room and the throne and the angels and all that's going on. It's just a magnificent sight. One day we'll see it with our own eyes and truly understand its awesome glory. Right? And so, uh, real quick. So, um, 
we see – well, I'm just going to leave it alone. We'll talk about it next time. Uh, the conclusion, because I think we'll go deeper into it, and I don't want to just gloss over it. So, okay. If we just take the verses above and put them together, we get the following amazing description of Father God. So we started this off with me making a description. This is me literally just taking all the verses, removing the references, and putting them in order. That's all I did, okay? For our God indeed is a devouring fire. A river of fire was streaming forth and proceeding from his presence. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. They were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a exceedingly loud trumpet. An enormous cloud with lightning flashing such uh, that bright light rend it and came from it like glowing amber from the middle of the fire. God comes from Teman, the Holy One from the Mount of Paran, Salah. His splendor has covered the skies. The earth is full of his glory. His brightness will be as lightning. Immediately I was in the spirit and the throne was standing in heaven with someone singing on it, seated, seated on it. High above on the throne was the form that appeared to be a man. His attire was like white like snow. I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen, and around his waist was the belt made of gold from Uphaz. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, and high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The hair of his head was like lamb's wool, and the one seated on it was like jasper and carnelian in appearance. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man on above it. I saw that it was glowing metal as the appearance of fire within it all around. From the appearance of his waist upward and from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw it was the appearance of fire. His arms and feet had the gleam of polished bronze, a two-pronged lightning bolts flashing from his hands. This is the outward display of his power. His eyes were like blazing torches, and his face had the appearance of lightning, and there was bright around him as the appearance of the rainbow that is in the clouds in the day of rain so was the appearance of the brightness all around him this was the appearance of the likeness of Yahweh's glory praise God that is super awesome I don't know if that'll get you excited I'm gonna check your heartbeat because I don't know that's pretty neat it's like I remember the first time I heard the show far blast I got so excited because in my mind connected that's what it's gonna sound like when God returned when Jesus comes back for us right and so when I when we do these these things, the same thing clicks. It's like, oh, this is what my dad looks like. It's like seeing a picture of your dad you never got to see before. You know? And so uh, that's why I wanted to start that way and end that way. But I wanted to prove it in the middle. You know, And so we don't want to make an idol of what we just read or make something in our hearts or minds or think about it when we're praying. But it's okay to think about it. It's okay to contemplate and ponder why God does what he does and what he looks like. You know, But as we've seen in Exodus, God didn't want them to make idols of him. That's not what he desires because he is more than his appearance. But his appearance is awesome. It's beautiful. It's amazing. You know, and so we will continue on with the appearance of God in our next study, you know, which will be quite awesome. So praise God. Let's pray. Praise God. Dear Father, we glorify you. We exalt you. We lift you up. Thank you so much for allowing us to have a, a, a brief description, a limited understanding. Yeah, a beautiful understanding of what you look like, how you are, that we are like you and that we can see ourselves and know in basic form and function what you look like and how you operate and what you do. And so we glorify you. So it, it is an honor and it's a privilege to one, be your child, but two, to be made in your likeness and in your presence and that one day you'll make us immortal like you are immortal. And so this shows how much you love your family, how bad you want to be with us, how much you want to share your power, that you're not a God who hides himself and dominates and doesn't want to share but you want to share and you want to give good things, but you don't want us to hurt ourselves. So we praise you for that. Help us to just be renewed in our hope and our faith and know that you are the one true God. There's no one else like you. You are the one God in the entire universe. Everybody else is fakers. They are false. They're fake. And I don't stand for it because you're the one true God. And I, I will defend your name forever. For as long as you allow me to upon this earth, we glorify you. We exalt you. We lift you up. You're awesome. And I love you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com